During the three years that I have been making videos on this channel, I have only encountered two shiny Pokemon. The first one was Rattata in Pokemon Crystal, which I encountered during my Nuzlocke before I had Pokeballs. The second was a shiny Poochiena, which I found while filming my Love Disc video. So today, I'm going to be doing a playthrough of Pokemon Emerald with that exact shiny Poochiena. So this video is not going to be like most on my channel, where I start with a genetically perfect Pokemon. Instead, I'm going to take this shiny as it was given to me by the game. By the way, I nicknamed it Kyle, so I'll be referring to it as Kyle throughout the rest of this video. Also, since this is a special video, I am going to allow it to evolve during the playthrough, and because it won't have perfect stats, this isn't going to be useful for rankings like I normally do at the end of all my videos. So now let's talk about Kyle's stats. Well, first of all, it starts at level 13, which is going to be nice just to speed things up against Roxanne. Its ability is Runaway, which is basically useless in a solo challenge. And now, let's see what my IVs are. So, the Shiny Poochiena has 12 HP, 31 attack. Yes, it has a perfect attack stat. However, things go downhill from there. It has 13 defense, 12 special attack, 5 special defense, and 3 speed. By the way, in Generation 3, the Pokémon's hidden power type is also determined by IVs, so this Poochiena has hidden power Grass, and it is base 36 power. So this move is not going to be useful at all. So now let's go through Poochiena's base stats. It has 35 HP, 55 attack, 35 defense, 30 special attack and special defense, and 35 speed. Honestly, not a very good Pokemon, and it is a mono dark type, but in Generation 3, all dark type moves deal special damage, which utilizes its worse offensive stat. And here I should mention that my Poochiena has an adamant nature. This boosts its attack stat by 10% and lowers its special attack by 10%, which is going to make dark moves even worse. So basically, I'm just going to have to rely on all of my other moves and occasionally use a dark move here and there for coverage. And that's honestly a bit unfortunate because Poochiena has a decent move pool when it comes to dark moves. It starts with Tackle and Howl, and then through level up it gets Sand Attack, Bite, Odor Sleuth, which always felt like a weird name for a move for me. Then it gets Roar, Swagger, Scary Face, Takedown, Taunt, Crunch, and Thief. Through TMs and HMs, it gets access to Iron Tail, Return, Dig, Shadow Ball, Facade, Secret Power, and Rest. Oh, also, it does get access to Rock Smash, and in my original playthrough with Love Disc, I actually used Kyle for Rock Smash throughout the playthrough, and I could see that move coming in clutch against one specific trainer. However, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. There was a lot of game to go before then. Now, starting with a level 13 Pokemon gave me access to Bite right away, and since this move deals special damage, I figure that I can head into the gym in Rustboro City right away to take on Roxanne. First, she sends in a level 12 Geodude, I go for Bite, hoping for more than half damage, but it only does about a third. Then Geodude hits me with Rock Tomb, which almost does half, plus it lowers my speed, so much so that this first Geodude is just barely outspeeding me, and uh, yeah, as a result I do not even finish off Roxanne's first Pokemon. So it looks like starting the game with a level 13 Poochiena was not enough. Okay, so let's go to the route that connects Rustboro City to Rust Turf Tunnel. And here I'm going to fight trainers so that I can level Poochiena up. Against the very first one, he has Ninkata. And uh, I ran into some problems here because Leech Life is super effective, allowing it to heal. Luckily, I have an Orinberry, and that does allow Poochiena to pull through. But I'm going to have to head back to the Pokemon Center and heal. Instead of going back to that route where there is a guy with a Machop, I'm going to head into Roxanne's gym and finish off the three trainers here. And then this guy with a Shroomish gets really annoying. I'm paralyzed and I'm taking a lot of damage and I just barely managed to get through his team with three hit points remaining. So it turns out Poochiena is really bad, so I decide to fight some wild Pokemon, leveling it up to level 18, where it can evolve into a Mightyena. By the way, I am really happy that they kept the same golden color for this shiny. In Generation 2, when I caught my first shiny, which was a shiny Swinub, when I evolved it into Piloswine, I was so disappointed, because it went from a really awesome blue color to like this puke brown, and it was just terrible. Alright, so with Mighty Anna, let's take on Roxanne. Now, Bite is doing way more than half. Judo just goes for Defense Curl, then Roxanne uses a Potion. However, that's not going to help because Bite is special, and I finish off her lead. Now, the second Geodude goes for Rock Tomb, lowering my speed, but now it's not enough to move first, so I finish it off and move on to her final Pokemon, Nose Pass. 
bite looks like it's doing a little bit more than a quarter. However, the nose pass just goes for harden on the first turn. It hits me with rock tomb on the second turn, which is enough to lower my speed so that the nose pass is going first. Now, I want to mention something important here, which is the fact that the generation 3 AI considers rock tomb a speed control move. What that means is that once the nose pass has your speed lower than its 17 speed, it is going to discontinue using Rock Tomb altogether and choose moves like Block, Harden, or Tackle. So this actually gives the player a lot of play for Roxanne's Ace, because if you know you can survive Rock Tomb until you're slower than the nose pass, it is going to start using moves that are much worse, giving you time to finish it off. And so with that, I'm able to earn myself the first badge, and with it comes a 10% boost to my attack stat. I head back to Rust Turf Tunnel and save Pico, and then I do the optional battle against Brendan in Rustboro City. Later in the playthrough, I think that his Torchic might become scary when he gets fighting type moves, but for now it's not an issue, so that's just some fast experience for me. And now it's time to pick up HM users for the rest of the playthrough. By the way, today I will be naming all of these after people who support me at the Venomoth tier here on YouTube. So the first one, which is Talo, is named Tangerine. The second one, Meryl, is named GM. And the third one is a Zigzagoon, which I named Jonathan. By the way, thank you so much for the financial support. It really means a lot. If you don't want to support me, though, you can just like the video, which does make me feel better about myself. And you can also subscribe to the channel because I'm getting very close to 60,000 subscribers. I will have to release a special video when we get there. Okay, so I delivered the letter to Steven, and now I have a choice to make. Do I want to stay on Duford Island and face Brawly, who has a type advantage over my Deanna, or should I proceed with the playthrough and head to Slateport City? In this case, I think that going to Slateport City makes way more sense. After all, there are a lot of trainers on the beach that I can fight to get additional experience. Also, I'm going to pick up the Soft Sand here, an Ether, as well as a Heart Scale. After defeating all the trainers outside, I also head into the little, like, Soda Pop beach house and fight all the trainers here. Once you defeat them, you can talk to this guy and it'll give you six soda pops, which are really great healing items throughout the next portion of the game. Also, I am starting to go to the Mart in Slateport City every single playthrough. This is so I can pick up Paralyze heals for the next route of the game, and I can also grab Escape Ropes here so that every time I need to get out of a dungeon area, I can just do it instantaneously. After grabbing some extra experience as well as a rare candy in the Trick House, I have to face Brendan again. Now in this fight, his Torchic has evolved into a Combuskin, and it now knows Double Kick, which it loves to combo together with Focus Energy. However, I do have Howl, and his first Wingull is quite bad. So I'm going to set up three times boosting my attack stat to 167, and then I use Tackle to one-shot his lead. Okay, time for the Combuskin. I go for Tackle, it does more than half, it just sets up Focus Energy, giving me another turn to knock it out, and so I've bypassed Double Kick altogether. The only Pokemon he has left over is Lombre, and I easily finish it off. Alright, so in Mauville City, I pick up the HM for Rock Smash, and I am going to teach this to Mightyena right away. Now, this does have a disadvantage, which is the fact that I am not going to be able to unlearn this move until I get to Lily Cove City much further into the playthrough. But for now, it's going to be a good move to have, especially against Watson's Magneton, which is coming up very soon. Now here, I'll mention another change that I've made to my regular playstyle, which is I'm always going to pick up the acro bike here in the bike shop. For a while, I was just not getting the bike because I have banned it. It is way too hard to move around the map on 4 times speed using a Generation 3 bike. Yeah, I'm just not going to be doing that. However, I am going to allow this item whenever I have to traverse terrain. And so it gives me a bit of a shorter path back to the magma hideout when I need to go there later in the game. Okay, so with that out of the way, I defeat Wally, and then all of the trainers in the surrounding areas. This leads me over to the Rust Turf Tunnel, where I can pick up the Black Glasses, which I'm sure will be useful at some point. And then, I have to make my way back to Watson's Gym, where I also fight all of the trainers. Now here I want to mention the fact that when Poochiana evolved, it lost the ability Runaway, so now my ability is Intimidate, which unfortunately is not going to be that useful against Watson, who's next. Something I find frustrating about Generation 3 is the fact that they provide you the TM for Dig after you defeat Watson, as well as the TM for Secret Power. If these two moves were like moved to like, let's say, Cycling Road, playthroughs would be so much easier at this point of the game. In this case, what I'm relying on is setup with Howl, and then damage from Tackle for most of his Pokemon, and then finally Rock Smash against the Magneton. However, I'm arriving here with half health, so I do not like my chances. Luckily for me, with plus three, Rock Smash does more than half, Magneton goes for Thunder Wave, which I cure with a Cherry Berry, and then I knock out what is typically his hardest Pokemon. 
on. All right, so I'm making to his ace Manectric, which is really great. It goes for Howl on the first turn. I use Rock Smash, hoping for a defense drop, and I get it. However, this activates Static, paralyzing me. The Manectric moves first, hitting Shockwave. Paralysis prevents my move, and with that, Watson defeats Mightyana. And that fight was when I got good luck, because while I set up against the Voltorb, bad things can happen to me. It can paralyze me by using Spark, and then it can also just use Self-Destruct, dealing a lot of damage to Mightyena. This time, I only got plus two attack, and I was hoping this would give me the two hit on the Magneton. It does look like it will. It definitely will in the case that I get the defense drop, but because I'm paralyzed, I'm just not gonna be able to win, so that's a second loss. In the next battle, I was pretty committed to getting more attack. However, this doesn't work out because then I'm paralyzed earlier on, and that is just a death sentence. I tried one more time, but Mightyena consumes its Cherry Berry against the Voltorb. I proceed with the fight wanting to not be paralyzed against the rest of his team, but I just don't have what I need, so I think it is time to do some additional training. Luckily for me, I didn't fight the Wind Straits, so I can face them now, earning that experience. And then I head south of the city to clean up one additional trainer, this Fisher, who I didn't fight before. And then I have to face wild Pokemon until I level Mightyena up to the next damage rounding threshold. And I hate to say it, but this really doesn't change the Watson fight that much. I get reset after reset after reset against him. However, eventually luck goes my way, because against the Magneton, I get a critical hit with Rock Smash and knock it out in one turn. Okay, so I'm making it to the Manectric, however, I only have plus two, which is not great. Rock Smash does a third, lowering Manectric's defense, and then I decided to go for Tackle, because it actually has a higher base power. In Generation 3, Rock Smash has base 20 power, it is an absolutely terrible move. However, Tackle does have a 5% chance to miss, and of course in this case, when I need it to work the most, it doesn't. Mightyena gets hit by Shockwave, taking it to half health. By the way, I am speed tied right now, so the Manectric moves first, hitting Shockwave, taking me all the way down to red hit points. And now it is the moment of truth. Will Kyle's next Tackle hit? And in this case, it does, finishing Manectric off. So, I've earned myself technically the third badge, but in this case it is my second badge, and this one boosts my speed by 10%. In the next section of the game, Mighty N is going to get some major moveset upgrades. First, after clearing out some trainers on the next route, I am able to pick up the TM for Secret Power, which is a long overdue upgrade for Tackle. Also, it is nice having a 100% accurate go-to move that can be boosted by Howl. Next, in Fall Arbor Town, I pick up the TM for Dig, which in this case I am going to have to teach in the place of Bite. Remember, I cannot unlearn Rock Smash. Keeping Howl, I think, makes the most sense, and Secret Power has a lot of flexibility. After all, on regular terrain, it has a 30% chance to cause paralysis. So now let's take an uneventful gondola ride up a mountain and face Maxi. Now normally, this fight is very easy. It's a bit annoying that I get hit by Intimidate at the start, but I can just use Howl to counter this. However, then I get my accuracy lowered by sand attack, which is quite annoying. I don't have any moves that bypass accuracy checks. I'm able to finish the Mighty Anna off, but then I realized I'd made a mistake because I didn't heal my PP before going into this battle. So by the time the camera up comes out, I have no uses of secret power left over. Then Dig misses, Mighty Anna gets burned. I go back underground because remember, this is basically the only move I can use. And camera up goes for magnitude, dealing double damage to Mighty Anna, and it goes down. In the next fight, I tried foregoing the setup with Howl, and I make it back to the camera up, but then it gets a uh, magnitude 10, also scoring a critical hit. So yeah, that definitely knocks Mighty Anna out. In the next fight, I continue making the same mistake and not healing Secret Powers PP. So once again, I lose. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> ah. But luckily in the fourth fight against Maxi, I do not forget to heal my PP, and as a result, I am able to emerge victorious. So now it's time to head to Laverage Town, where waiting for me is what is typically the fourth gym leader, but in this case, the third gym leader, Flannery. I expect this battle is going to be extremely easy. Her first Pokemon is Nummel, and uh, it is very bad, so I can take my time here to set up with Howl. I am going to get hit by the occasional Magnitude, and then Overheat does hit, taking Mighty Anna down to half health. And at this point, I have plus three, and I figured that that was going to be enough to sweep. I knock the Nummel out, Slugma is next. 
It is also really bad. So I finish it off. Then she sends in Camrupt. Now this one does not know magnitude, so I am totally safe going for dig here, and with super effective damage and my modifications, I'm easily able to one-hit it. All that's left is her ace Torkoal. I go underground with dig and take it down with a single hit. So with that, I have earned myself the heat badge. So now, because I'm relying on physical moves, I am going to backtrack to Fall Arbor Town and pick up the TM for a return so that I can teach this in the place of secret power. After that, I backtrack through the middle of the map and then wake up everyone because I'm gonna head back to face Brawly now. By the way, you cannot face Norman until you've defeated the first four gym leaders. So I do have to do this here. However, by this time, Kyle is level 39. I have way more speed than all of his Pokemon and return is able to one-shot all three of them. So with him out of the way, let's head into the Petalburg gym and face Norman. Now I don't think that this fight is going to be particularly difficult because I have Dig to counter the slacking. However, I did want to set up a little bit with Howl and I wasn't sure which Pokemon to do this on. In the end, I decided to do it against the Spinda. It's not very good. The only downside here is that it could use Teeter Dance. Luckily, it doesn't. I knock it out and Norman sends in slacking next. So because this thing's ability is Truant, I can just go underground with Dig every turn it's trying to attack me, and then deal damage on the turns that it's loafing around. By doing that, I knock it out very easily, and now I have a quick path to victory, one-shotting both of Norman's final two Pokémon with Return. So, the Balance Badge gives me a 10% boost to my defense stat, and it also gives me access to the HM for Surf. In most playthroughs, this gives me access to a lot of great TMs, like perhaps Thunderbolt or maybe Ice Beam, but in the case of Mightyena, I am not going to have access to anything new right now. So instead, I just collect some rare candies, pick up some berries, and then head into the Weather Institute to face the Team Aqua members here. They are very easy to finish off. Then I have to face Brendan. He is also completely trivial. And with that out of the way, it is now time to face Winona. I expect that this fight is going to be fairly easy. I have to knock the Swablu out on turn 1 just because it has Parish Song, luckily Return gets the one hit, and then Winona sends in Tropius. Now, this thing isn't particularly intimidating, so I'm going to set up Howl here to boost my attack stat. After all, I really want to ensure that I am going to at least two-hit her Skarmory when it comes out. I figured that plus four was enough, and then I knocked the Tropius out with Return. Next, she sends in Pelipper, probably the most annoying trainer Pokemon in all of Generation 3. To play around its common turn one Protect, I go for Howl to set up a little bit more, but then it uses Super Sonic actually hits, Mightyena damages itself, and because I've set up to plus five, the confusion damage is absolutely massive, and that gives me a reset. Okay, so in the next battle, I am just going to use Return. Uh, of course, this time it goes for Protect. It actually goes for Protect two times in a row, both times being successful, but on the third turn, I knock it out. Next is Skarmory. Here, I went for Rock Smash because it could lower defense, and I figured that Return was going to two-hit anyways. It doesn't do much damage, but my Return on the next turn knocks it out. Okay, so all that's left is her Ace Altaria. This thing does not have the defenses that Skarmory does, so Return one-shots it, and with that, I have earned myself the sixth badge. On my way to Lily Cove City, I stop by Mount Pyre, and I'm going to do the extended section here, having to dodge this annoying guy who has Wobbuffet. The reason I'm doing this is so that I can obtain the TM for Shadow Ball, because in Generation 3, ghost moves are physical, and I figure that this is going to be the best go-to move against the upcoming gym leaders, Tate and Liza, as well as against Phoebe in the League. It feels sort of wrong to have to do this when I'm using a dark type Pokemon, but I just don't want to be using dark type moves. After all, look at my special attack stat. It is less than half of my physical attack. In Lily Cove City, I talk to the move deleter so that I can finally get rid of Rock Smash, and in its place, I'm going to teach Shadow Ball. I grab the TM for rest, pick up some items in the harbor, and now it's time to head to the Magma Hideout to face Maxi again. I hope that he is not going to be as difficult as he was last time. However, before I get to him, I'm facing a Grunt, and when I knock out his Zubat, I have a chance to learn Crunch. Here's the thing though, it doesn't really synergize with my moveset that much. Howl allows me to boost the damage of Shadow Ball, but Crunch is not going to get any boosts, so I think I would rather say no to it now. If I need it later on, I can always use the Move Tutor to teach it to Mightyena with a Heart Scale. 
Okay, so let's face Maxi. This fight should be easier because I have access to the Person Berry now. You can't actually get one of these for the battle on Mount Chimney unless you get really lucky in the Flower Hut early on in the game. What this berry allows me to do is get hit by Swagger, boosting my attack stat, and then I cure the confusion and knock out his lead Mightyena. Next is Crobat. Unfortunately, this thing is faster than me because I was hit by a scary face, so it gets Confuse Ray off, which is really annoying. However, in the end, that doesn't matter, because I still land two more returns, defeating Maxi. Okay, so it's time for Team Aqua Admin Matt. He is probably the most stylish trainer in the game. However, once again, the Person Berry allows me to get around Swagger and easily finish his team off. With the two hideouts out of the way, I do some exploring, picking up a second TM for a return. After that, I take the Rapids down to pick up one more rare candy. And with that, I am now ready to face Tate and Liza. So something that has taken me way too long to realize is the fact that only two of their Pokemon can actually hit Dark types. The Clay Doll with Earthquake and Ancient Power, and the Soul Rock with Solar Beam and Flamethrower. This is going to make the battle against Tate and Liza quite easy for Mightyena. On the first turn, I set up Howl to boost my attack just a little bit. I want to make sure that I am going to knock out their Pokemon in one turn. Next, I target the Clay Doll to knock it out. After all, the Zatu can't do anything to me. They send in Soul Rock next. Now, instead of targeting this thing, I'm actually going to knock the Zatu out because Soul Rock is going to go for Sunny Day on the first turn. Then I can take it out next, and all they have left is Lunatone, which cannot damage me. So, as was anticipated, this was a completely trivial battle, and Mightyena earns itself the seventh badge. This one boosts both my special attack and my special defense, which is kind of nice. Like, the defensive boost is great, but I don't think I'm going to be using any Dark-type moves anytime soon. And that brings us to the battle in the Space Center, where, uh, yeah, I actually do get a reset. Confusion is really annoying when you're setting up your attack stat. However, there's an easy way to play around this. Now that I have Surf, I can head back to this route, where there are a ton of person berries growing, so we'll just pick those and then go back to the fight. Now Swagger is not going to be able to confuse me, so I'm able to counter their shenanigans and take the victory. These person berries continue to be useful against Team Aqua leader Archie. Once again, I get the free Swagger boost, and then the Crobat comes out mirroring the battle against Maxi. It moves first, using Confuse Ray, but once again, Mighty Enna does not hit itself, and I take the victory. Okay, so with Rayquaza saving the day, I head into Juan's gym. Now, I have said in the past that these little ice puzzles are not really that hard on 4 times game speed, but today I was not paying attention. I think I was looking over at Churro, he's like, he's got his little cat bed right beside my computer, so he did something really cute by stretching out his paws and kind of rolling over. I uh, looked over for a second and messed this one up, which means that I have to drop down to the bottom floor. This is a bit annoying because it costs some time. If you make the mistake on the final puzzle, then there are two mandatory trainers that you have to face. However, with them out of the way, I'm able to complete the puzzles and make it to Wan. Once again, the Person Berry is going to be the go-to item here. Because he starts with a Love Disc, and this thing is great at confusing you with moves like Water Pulse or Sweet Kiss. As a result, I'm just going to take my time and set up Howl until I get confused. This happens after I get plus two, and then I use Return to knock Wan's lead out. Next, he sends in Whiskash, I go for Return, and it does more than enough to knock the fish out. Next is Celio. Return continues doing enough damage. Okay, will it be enough for the Crawdont? And the answer is yes, even though this thing has more defense. But I was pretty sure that the Kingdra was going to survive. However, I was surprised when it didn't. So, Mighty Anna takes an easy victory over the last gym leader. The only thing left to do before the league, of course, is defeat Wally. He is not a problem. So during this fight, I'm just going to mention that I am not going to upgrade my moveset going into the league. This will wall off moves like Crunch in case I wanted to learn them between league members, but I don't think that I'm going to need to. Right now, I think that Howl in combination with some intelligent play is going to be enough for Mighty Anna to defeat all of the league members. Well, there's only one way to find out, so let's do this. The first Elite Four member, of course, is Sydney. Now, I'm just going to mention it right away because I think all of you are going to notice. I am holding a Person Berry, but this Mighty Anna does not, in fact, have Swagger. As a kid, I remember facing Sydney and him using Swagger against me. However, that must have been the Shift Tree, not the Mighty Anna. So I just have a completely useless held item in this fight. The item that is much more useful against Sydney is the White Herb, which prevents stat changes. It counters out Intimidate from the first Mighty Anna and would have saved me one turn of setup with 
with Howl. And that would have had a really big impact on this fight, specifically because the Mighty Yenna using Sand Attack is really awful. I do not have any moves that bypass accuracy checks, so I'm missing too much and that gives me one reset. In the next fight, I decided to adjust my strategy, knock the Mighty Yenna out right away, and then set up on the shift tree, but this has its own consequences, because then this thing can set up double team as well as torment, which is quite annoying. Also, even doing that, I had to two hit the Mighty Yenna, so I was hit by a sand attack in the process, which gives me minus one accuracy and another loss. I'm going to completely skip over two resets here because I think I was being a little bit too stubborn. Honestly, in retrospect, I should have just gone back, picked up the white herb and used it here. That would have saved so many headaches because I think I could have just gone with plus one, knocked out the Mighty Yenna in a single turn, and then moved on to the rest of the fight where I could have set up a little bit more against Shiftry and just swept Sydney's team. However, it turns out that not having the white herb here is actually going to benefit me, so just hold on to that idea for a little bit later on. In this fight, despite having minus four, I managed to knock out Sydney's Crawdont with Return on the very first turn that it was in battle, and then he finally sends out his Absol. Okay, Return, please work. Okay, it doesn't, but this Absol loves to set up Swords Dance on the first turn. I miss another return. This is pretty scary, but it just goes for Swords Dance again, which is lucky for me. With my third return, Mighty Anna hits, and finally, Sydney is defeated. Although that was definitely one of my worst performances against him. Next is Phoebe, and I expect that this battle is going to be quite simple. After all, her initial Dusclops goes for Protect on the first turn, allowing me to set up one Howl for free. Then, I can use Shadow Ball, which is super effective, to knock it out, as well as the following Bayonet. The Sableye that's next does survive, but it's not that scary. I finish it off, take out the following Bayonet, and now it's time for her final Dusclops. Honestly, this thing is very tanky, and I usually expect that it's going to survive one hit, but today it doesn't. I just knock it out. So we're moving on to Glacia. Whenever you have a setup move in this fight, you want to hold the Cherry Berry so that the first Celio does not paralyze you with Body Slam. Then, you can use the setup move as many times as you want until you consume your Berry, and after that, you can just sweep the rest of her team, providing you have outspeeds against the rest of her Pokémon. And in this case, Mighty Yenna does. However, at plus three, I just decide that I don't even need to wait for the Paralysis, and I can just start my sweep now. I think I have enough attack. I finish off her first Glalie in one hit, her second Celio goes down to one hit. Okay, so now it's her two toughest Pokemon, the level 52 Glalie, which does go down to a single critical hit return, and now all that's left is her ace, Walrein. I go for return, and it gets the one hit, so Mighty Anna is moving on to Drake. For this fight, I'm going to give it the Silk Scarf to boost the damage of Return just a little bit. Now, starting the battle off against Drake, this Shelgon loves to go for Protect as well, so I can set up Howl here. And I think I got a little bit overconfident that I was going to knock the Shelgon out in one hit. However, its name has Shell in it, and this is actually Drake's most defensive Pokémon. As a result, Return does not get the one hit. Shelgon strikes back with Rock Tomb, lowering Mighty Anna's speed, and now I am slower than all of Drake's Pokémon. What this means is that I'm going to take chip damage from all of his team members, even if I get the one hit. And I am not getting one hits. So I'm going to need more than plus one to have success in this battle. However, in the next battle, what I learned is that while I'm trying to set up Howl, the Shelgon is going to get a Rock Tomb in because it's trying to speed control me. And as a result, I am not going to have the speed I need to move first against his other Pokemon, and the same scenario is going to play out. I used three rare candies to take Mighty Anna up over the next damage rounding threshold to level 63, and now against the Shelgon I actually get very lucky. It uses Dragon Claw instead of Rock Tomb, and this allows me to one hit it with Return. Okay, let's see what my damage range is like against the Altaria when I have plus two. Uh, it is not enough. Are you kidding me? This allows the Altaria to set up one Dragon Dance. Drake uses a full restore, and then I get a critical hit. All right, so that's nice. What's my damage range like against the Kingdra? Also not enough. It goes for Dragon Dance. Then it goes for Surf, which isn't really a good combo. I knock it out and move on to the Flygon. However, here I actually have a speed tie. It moves first, hitting Earthquake, taking Mighty Anna down to red health. And then there's some Floor Restore stuff, and I eventually take it out. Last is Salamence. I can't believe I made it here. But even without the Rock Tomb, this thing moves first. It has 132 speed, so Mighty Anna faints. 
It was at this point that what I had determined I would need would be plus three attack, as well as no minus speed from Rock Tomb, and that is just way too unlikely. So I went into this fight with the intent of blacking out, because I wanted to be able to go back to the beginning of the league, start it all over again, and come back to this fight at a higher level, hopefully with enough speed to move first against the Salamence, as well as enough attack to one-hit all of his Pokémon with only plus two. Okay, so let's continue my bad play, and I promise you all I am actually going to benefit from this bad play, because once again, I am forgetting to use the White Herb against Sydney, And as a result, that leads to one loss against him before I finally make my way through the league back to Drake. So now I am going into this fight at level 63, and this naturally gives me the speed tie with the Flygon, and I'm underspeeding the Salamence, which is annoying. And I was hoping for a bit better damage ranges here against the Shellgon, but I'm not able to knock it out with plus one. However, if I keep it on the run and Drake uses a full restore, then I will be able to take it down without having my speed impacted. Unfortunately though, the Altaria does damage to me, taking me to about half before I get to the Kingdra. Return takes it to yellow, it goes for Dragon Dance twice in a row, allowing me to knock it out for free. All right, things are going really well in this fight, so can I win the speed tie against the Flygon? And the answer is yes. However, it still hits one Earthquake taking me to red before I knock it out following Drake's full restore. Unfortunately though, I don't have enough health to survive the Salamence, so it takes me down. All right, but I can use five rare candies to go up to level 68, and maybe this will give me the damage ranges that I need. So let's test with plus one attack. Against the Altaria, I don't get the one hit. Are you kidding me? That's so frustrating. What about the Kingdra? And the answer is also no. It hits me with smoke screen, which is just so frustrating. I do have to say that it is nice at level 68 that I am at least outspeeding his team members. Will I one-shot the Flygon? The answer is also no. It hits a second Earthquake. He uses a full restore, so I'm gonna knock it out. We will be able to test the damage ranges against the Salamence. Uh, but I actually end up missing here, so the Flygon takes me down. I don't even get to test against the Salamence. So once again, I am going to black out. And here is where my mistake actually turns into an advantage, because now I can pick up the White Herb, and I am not going to use it against Sydney. I am going to save it for Drake. Luckily for me, this time I don't have any resets against Sydney, so I make it all the way back to the Dragon Master without losing too much time. Going into this fight, I only used two rare candies, so once again I am level 68. And you might think that's a little bit weird because last time I did not have the damage ranges I needed, but this time I can set up with Howl against the Shellgon until it uses Rock Tomb. Then my speed is dropped, the White Herb prevents that speed drop, and after that I can use Return to knock the Shellgon out with one hit. Now I have plus three for the rest of the battle, and that is going to give me the one hit on all of Drake's remaining Pokemon. While I do that, I just want to mention the fact that I really appreciate all of you. So many times I am making strange misplays, and you just have to sit through them and watch it happen. I am sure it is really frustrating. Playing the game on four times speed and trying to balance all of the different things going through my mind is quite hard, and it is very easy to get hyper fixated on one area of the play, like every time there's a Mightyena, just use the Person Berry. That is usually the best choice, but it's not. And then in the case of Sydney, I should have tried to find an alternative strategy, but I didn't because it was luck that I was losing to because of Sand Attack. I figured I could just muscle my way through it, but I couldn't. Now, by the way, at the end of the Drake fight, his Salamence does survive one of my hits, but it is not enough to take Mightyena out. So, for the first time in this playthrough, I am moving on to the champion Wallace. So right away, in this battle, I have a problem. Do I set up Howl, or try and knock the Wailord out to prevent Water Spout damage? In this case, I go for Return to do damage to it, and as a result, I take less damage from Water Spout. I'm taking about a quarter, so I figure I can set up Howl at least twice now before I finish his lead off. However, what that means is by the time it goes down, I only have 22 hit points left over. I am really hoping that plus two is going to give me one hits on all of his remaining Pokemon now. I secure it on the Tentacruel, next is the Ludicolo. By the way, this thing seems kind of not that intimidating, but it actually is. Luckily, I finish it off, move on to the Whiskash, which I also one hit, and then the Gyarados comes out, which triggers its Intimidate, lowering my attack to plus one. As a result, I do not get the one hit. Gyarados goes for Earthquake, which is a really weird move for it to know. And as a result, Mightyena gets knocked out. 
You may have noticed that in the previous battle I was holding the Petra Berry, and this is because I'm usually scared against Wallace because he likes to use Toxic with either his Tentacruel or his Milotic. But in this case, I am not scared of that because the Whale Lord does not have Toxic, so I might as well take the Silk Scarf into the battle so I can do a little bit more damage with Return. What I was hoping for here is that even with Intimidate, I'm going to be able to knock the Gyarados out in a single hit, but then the Ludicolo gets Swift Swim boosted by the rain and hits Mighty Anna with Giga Drain, knocking me out. Ugh. By the way, I have to add a function to my software so that I'll recalculate the opponent's stats when there is rain on the field and they have an ability like Swift Swim. So that is something that we have to look forward to in the future. So maybe what I need is a completely different approach. If I teach Rest in the place of Shadow Ball, which is not really that useful anymore, then I can also hold a Chesto Berry, which will allow me to recover a lot of health, and then hopefully set up a little bit more against the initial Whale Lord. Unfortunately, just after I've healed, he uses Blizzard getting a critical hit and taking me back down to orange health. Okay, I have to say that is a bit annoying, but this time I do manage to make it back to the Gyarados. So I have two choices, try and roll for like a critical hit or perhaps not getting knocked out by Earthquake, or go for rest and try and out heal the damage that Earthquake is going to deal. In this case, I choose to go for return, it does not get the KO, Gyarados hits Earthquake, and Mighty Etta survives on one hit point. And this allows me to knock it out and finally move on to Wallace's Milotic. Okay, so I'm probably gonna do this, but uh, the Milotic survives, goes for Ice Beam, and Mighty Enna faints. What if I change my move ordering against the Whale Lord so that I take less damage against it? I can use Return on turn 1 to have its HP, and then I can use Dig to take it down to red HP so that I'm taking very little damage from Water Spout. However, uh, the issue is here that I forget that once Wallace heals it, I am no longer in the clear, and I'm sure a lot of you will be frustrated watching this play because the Whale Lord hits a full HP Water Spout, and uh, yeah, it does massive damage, so that's a reset. Okay, but there might be another approach. What if I just spam return and don't even try to set up Howl? In this case, I get very lucky because I critical hit the Whale Lord, and then the following Tentacruel misses Hydro Pump, and I knock it out with two hits from return. Okay, time for the Ludicolo. And here I figured maybe it's not going to do that much damage to me, so let's set up Howl. And it's kind of mirroring me by setting up double team, but it turns out Surf is actually dealing decent damage, and the Ludicolo does end up taking Mighty Anna down. Okay, let's go back to the return dig strategy against the Whale Lord. In this case though, I get frozen, that's frustrating. And I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I actually get frozen a second time trying this strategy. Okay, so now let's examine the turn ordering here. Turn 1, return on the Waylord to have its HP. It goes for Rain Dance, and then I use Dig to take it down to red HP. This allows me to both stall the rain out and get one Howl in for free when Wallace uses his healing item. Now, because the rain is still active, I'm going to go for Dig instead of Return, just to stall it out a little bit longer. Also, Water Spout and Blizzard only have 5 PP each, so if I can make the Whale Lord miss, that is really good. In this case, it reestablishes the rain, and now I want everyone to focus on the screen. Look at how much my next dig does. It takes Whale Lord all the way down to a tiny sliver, and Water Spout does almost nothing. Okay, so now is my moment. I am going to set up Howl once, tank a Blizzard, that takes me to orange health. I am able to go for one more howl and just barely survive the following blizzard. Like honestly, I think if the Whale Lord rolled better damage, I would have lost there. So this is pretty lucky. Now I can use rest to heal, the Chesto Berry to wake up, and with Whale Lord missing another blizzard, Mighty Enna is now ready to sweep. Okay, so I should have guaranteed one hits on all of Wallace's Pokemon now. I'm gonna have plus two once I make it to the Gyarados and get intimidated. So will I get the one hit? And the answer is... No, actually, the Gyarados survives, but because my health is higher, it decides to set up, and that gives me one more chance to roll damage, and this time I take the Gyarados out, so I think I got like the worst possible damage range against it. Next is Milotic, I go for Return, and Mighty Anna takes it out. Finally, I have defeated Wallace. It was honestly a pretty bumpy road, but there is still one more trainer left, and I think he is going to be more challenging than anything I've had to go up against so far in the playthrough. So, let's get ready to take on Steven Stone. To do that, I'm going to head to the move reminder because I don't want return anymore. It is useless against all of his steel and rock type Pokemon. Instead, I think I'm going to take Crunch into this fight. Also, just before I make it to him in Meteor Falls, I am going to pick up the TM for Iron Tail because I can see this being useful. 
Also, I defeat one wild Pokemon to level up to level 70. And then, after using rare candies, my Mighty Enna is level 80. So, let's take on the most challenging trainer in all of Hoenn. It's time for Steven Stone. In this first battle, what I really want to draw your attention to is the fact that the Skarmory is doing decent damage to Mighty Enna every time it hits me. There's a little bit of a lull at the beginning of the battle where I can set up Howl about three times while it sets up Toxic and Spikes. However, after that, things are not looking particularly good because it's just able to hit me with Steel Wing or re-poison me over and over and over again while I am trying to set up. Now, I will need plus six for this battle. I want to guarantee that I'm getting as much damage against all of his Pokemon as is possible. After all, I am having to use Crunch and Dig, which are objectively not very good moves at this point in the game. Dig is base 60 power and Crunch is base 80 power, but I have a terrible special attack stat. And you can really see that when I'm doing damage to the Skarmory, like it is doing so little. Essentially, this turns into a giant stall fest. Eventually, Rest's PP is getting quite low and I haven't fully set up up yet. So I had to make the choice to knock the Skarmory out without getting to plus 6 attack. However, what I was hoping is that plus 5 is going to be enough. Okay, up next is Armaldo, the Pokemon that I never know what type it is. Honestly, this thing looks like it is a Steel type. It's also on Steven's team. I always thought it was a Steel type. In this case though, it is in fact a Rock Bug type, which is so weird. In this case, it survives one hit from Dig, does some damage, taking me to orange health, and then I finish it off. Next, Steven sends out Claydol. This thing is very annoying because it has Levitate, so I'm going to have to rely on Crunch to knock it out, and this is going to let it set up its screens, minimizing damage for 5 turns. Unfortunately for me, it gets a critical hit while I'm asleep, forcing me to use Rest again to heal, and now I have no more PP in this move. When I wake up, I have red health, Crunch does half, and then Steven defeats me. Okay, so I don't think Crunch is the best move. I need something that is going to be physical to get boosts from Howl. Let's teach Iron Tail in its place. Now, while I have a few more unsuccessful battles against Steven, I'm just going to keep the move pool on the screen because I really want all of us to reflect on the number of physical options that Mighty Anna has available to it. I no longer have access to Shadow Ball because I unlearned it before Wallace and you can only obtain one of these TMs. For other physical moves, I could use a normal move like Secret Power, Facade, or Return, but as I mentioned before, due to type effectiveness, these are not very good against Steven. I actually think that that's one thing that Generation 3 does better than Generation 2, because usually at the end of my Crystal playthroughs I'm just spamming Return, but because of Steven's typing, you can't really rely on normal moves in these games like you can in Generation 2. After that, I am using both Iron Tail and Dig currently, and the only other non-normal physical move that I have access to is Rock Smash, and uh, no, that is definitely not going to be the answer. Even if it had base 40 power, I don't think that it would be useful at this point in the game. So with another two losses, I think that it is time to finally go and train. I'm going to defeat Wally in Victory Road as well as a bunch of wild Pokemon to take Mighty Anna up to level 71. Then I grab the Pokeblock case so I can pick up an extra rare candy in the Safari Zone. Now my Mighty Anna is level 83, and I am also going to go into this battle with a different held item, so instead of using the Chesto Berry, I am going to rely on the Leftovers. Overall, I think this is a little bit better, especially against the Skarmory, because then every turn I am gaining back some health, minimizing the damage that it is doing to me. Plus, the Chesto Berry is only used once, whereas the Leftovers has repeated value throughout the entire battle. The longer it takes, the more value it has, and believe me, this battle is a long one. However, in this case, I actually fairly easily get to plus six, so now it is just a matter of knocking the Skarmory out. My only choice here is Iron Tail, but luckily after all the setup, it is going to be a three hit. This takes a while, but eventually I do manage to take Steven's lead out, and I have green health remaining when he sends in his Armaldo. Okay, so against this thing, Iron Tail is by far the better choice, and I'm able to secure a one hit. Next is Claydol. Now, this thing is really annoying because it knows Reflect, and I don't have that many uses of Iron Tail, but luckily, even with the screen up, I almost knock it out in a single hit. Of course, Steven uses a full restore, and then my next Iron Tail takes it down. Okay, time for the Aggron. Now, I make what looks like a mistake here by choosing Iron Tail against the Aggron, but I am actually doing this intentionally, specifically because I want to stall out the Reflect counter. Both Cradley and Metagross have 
pretty good physical defenses, and I do not want to move on to them after one-shotting the Agron when Reflect is still in place. So things slow down here a little bit. The Agron uses a Solar Beam against me. By the way, this move is absolutely awful when Agron uses it because its special attack is really bad. Eventually, I take it out, and now it's time for the Cradily. Here, once again, Iron Tail is the better choice. I have three uses of it left, and I take Cradily out with one hit. Okay, so we've made it to Steven's Ace. It's time for the Metagross. Let's do this. Obviously, the best choice here is Dig. I go for it, and it does enough to take his final Pokemon out. So Kyle clocks in with a time of 2 hours, 43 minutes, and 5 seconds, with 37 resets at level 83. This took 8 hours and 38 minutes of game time. Because I think it's fun, let's just bring up the results for Pokemon Emerald so far, and I want to see where Kyle fits into these results. Obviously, this isn't a perfectly fair comparison, because the Pokemon in this list had near-perfect DVs, as well as fairly optimized hidden power and natures. Like, some of them I got really wrong, like Sableye, for instance, but overall, the quality of this list is much better than the quality of my Mightyena. Kyle's results in terms of real-time place it just ahead of Sceptile and just behind Mawile. Okay, so a fairly underwhelming real real-time performance, kind of in the bottom third of contestants in Pokemon Emerald. I think that that makes sense though. After all, this thing is obtained on the early roots of the game. It is not supposed to be an amazing Pokemon. Now let's switch this chart over and look at some game time results. So here, with a time of 8 hours and 38 minutes, its time is actually 1 minute faster than Aerodactyl and 10 minutes slower than Mawile. So I think that is honestly a bit better of a result than I would have anticipated from Mightyena. However, here I think we should talk about the two different metrics and how they can really favor certain play styles. So if you are trying to get a low game time, just go into every battle and reset a million times. Because the game time is not changing, the real time is changing. So in this case, Kyle's real time ranks it higher than it would have otherwise been placed if it had to accumulate time to say, train up more levels and have more consistency in each fight. This is overall why I think real time is the better metric. After all, if I reset 30 seven times, that should have some impact on my results. And I could start breaking resets down into other categories and saying like, this reset doesn't count, this reset does count, something like that. But I really like the objective measure of just saying, this is how much time it took me in real time to beat the game with this Pokemon. It's really simple, easy to understand, and as a result I really prefer this metric. And that brings me to the future of my Emerald series. I'm sure a lot of you are eagerly anticipating the time when I start doing second playthroughs so that we can get more objective optimized results for all of these Pokemon. After all, the Mewtwo and Rayquaza results are not particularly good anymore, and that's because I played them early on when I was still learning these games. I did that intentionally because I want to do redos with both of them and release a Mewtwo vs Rayquaza video in the distant future. I figured that it would be fun to play them early on and then play them near the end of my journey in Pokemon Emerald so that we can see the difference that a lot of learning has on the results a Pokemon can achieve. However, what is the path to getting to that point where I do redos with all these Pokemon and re-rank them? Well, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that, and here's the decision I've come to. What I'm going to do is beat Pokemon Emerald with every final stage Pokemon, and once I complete that series, then I will go back, start doing redos. These redos will feature a lot of versus videos, where I put Pokemon that had close results head-to-head -to, -head to see which one can obtain the better result. So for example, using today's results and game time as a metric, if we look at Mighty Yenna, as well as Aerodactyl's results, they are actually quite close. So that is a sort of unexpected pairing that might be fun to do in a versus video. However, what does that mean for versus videos in the near future? Because I do want to start doing some in Pokemon Emerald. Well, what it means is that I'm only going to do one playthrough, and we are just going to go with those results because it is a part of this first attempt series. This is also going to allow me to pair Pokemon together that are thematically related, which might not have similar results. An example of that is Pokemon Yellow, where I put Hitmonlee up against Hitmonchan, and of course Hitmonchan did not have a chance, but the two are thematically paired, so it just felt like they should be in a video together. So then what I would do after I do all my first initial playthroughs in Pokemon Emerald, I would go, okay, Hitmonlee's results are more similar to this other Pokemon, so let's do a different versus video and put those two Pokemon together. I hope this is making sense for everyone. Also, when I start doing those redos, I will also begin playing the game with first stage Pokemon, and I anticipate that those runs are going to 
to be absolutely brutal. Anyways, it's an exciting future for this series. Thank you all so much for tuning in every week to see it. I really appreciate it. Like, subscribe, and ring the chime echo so you're notified every time I post a new video. Also, if you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, I really appreciate it. Finally, if you've made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next video.